Well, let me explain it this way. I think that there was always a fight in Elvis in, internally and in that he always struggled because he wanted to be one person but felt like he had to be another. Okay. And I, I, I think, you know, that that's, uh, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons that gospel music was so important to him. It soothed his soul because he grew up in church, you know, and he had that strong faith in God and he read the Bible every day. And, you know, he knew that, uh, uh, that, that life. And, you know, he knew that he was blessed by God. He was an ordinary man. He was just an ordinary man, but he was blessed by God to do extraordinary things and to touch people all over the world. And the way that he touched them was in the fact that it wasn't just his music. He was the greatest entertainer that ever walked on a stage, but he was also one of the dearest and greatest and finest men that ever walked on the stage of life. And he, he let people see his vulnerabilities he let people see that he uh, he cared about them. And money meant nothing to Elvis except what he could do for other people. Together, we go out there. Together, we begin to share. Welcome back to the show. Well, do you actually remember the first time your father ever cried? Well, I remember being seven when I saw my dad for the first time shed a tear. And my dad was certainly, being a scientist, not an easy one to, you know, kind of squeeze a tear out. But in 1977, his big idol, he was, I think, one of the biggest fans, died, passed, and that was Elvis Presley. And this is when I personally really understood what a big name, big figure, big persona, career, and shifter of the entire music industry evolution Elvis Presley was. Well, today, I'm so honored to have here on the show a family member of the Elvis Presley, may I say even clan, <laughs> and that is Donna Presley, the first cousin of Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll. Donna, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Patricia. It's great to be here. I'm very excited about it. Well, Donna, I am so excited, uh, but I'm so excited not only because I loved Elvis Presley as well in terms of his music, you know, having a little bit of a ballet history. I did a lot of choreography and of course Elvis Presley songs were, were kind of abused to do some of my choreography. But what I would like to uh, you to start with is put a little bit into perspective um, your own relationship with Elvis Presley how you perceived him first as a young um, adolescent and then also as a grown woman. Okay. Um, well, first of all, uh, so that people will understand my connection to the family, my mother Nash and Elvis's father Vernon were brother and sister. So I'm a first cousin. And from the time I was 10 years old, I spent all my summers at Graceland uh, because our grandmother, Dodger, lived there with Elvis. And so I would leave school a couple of weeks early and I would go to Graceland and I spend my entire summers there. And then right be a week before school started, my parents would come and get me and take me back home to Missouri, which is where I, I lived uh, until, you know, till, an, till the next summer. Um, so when I was about 15, Elvis called me and my mom and dad into the dining room because they had come to pick me up to take me home. And uh, he said, Aunt Nash, Uncle Earl, uh, we really love having Donnie living with us. And, and uh, Donnie was what he called me. He had nicknames for everybody. So it was always Donnie. And he said, we really love having Donnie stay with us. And he said, we want her to move in permanently with us. Uh, I will send her to school. I'll buy her a car uh, when she graduates from high school. I'll help her get into whatever you know she wants to get into. Well, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, yes, yes, awesome. And my mother goes, um, no. <laughs> he said, but <laughs> he said, but Aunt Nash. And she said, no, honey. She said, I know you would take good care of her. I know you love her and she would be fine. But she's my little girl and she's going home with me. Mm. So 
Okay, I went back home. But then when I was 17, um, which was just a couple of years later, Elvis bought the Circle G Ranch in Mississippi. And uh, my dad started to work for him. And so we moved on to the ranch and we lived there on the ranch from 67 to 69 uh, when Elvis decided he would, was going to try and sell it. So uh, he moved us up to the grounds of Graceland. So we lived right behind the house in a, in a mobile home there. Actually, it was the same one that he and Priscilla lived in on the ranch when he first uh, came there. So uh, we lived there and, uh, you know, I, I was there at the house every day. Um, I was 15 years younger than Elvis. Uh, so I was, you know, uh, just a kid, according, you know, to most people's standards. But, um, and I spent, you know, I spent great time with the whole family, you know, and, and I would see Elvis and, you know, we would talk and, and, uh, you know, have time together. I didn't travel with him. Uh, so I wasn't involved in the music or anything like that. And I, I didn't actually run around with him, you know, in, in the group when they would go places. So all my interactions, were either at the Circle G or at Graceland as a family member. So, um, you know, it was great times. It was uh, when Elvis was at home. Uh, I know my mom would laughingly call it uh, controlled chaos because uh, you never knew what he was going to do or what was going to happen next. Uh, but it was just, it was great fun. And he was absolutely um, the most loving, caring, tender passionate person i've ever met in my life i mean he was just wonderful um all the good things that you've ever heard about him are all true he was humble to a to a fault you know uh, he always made sure that everybody else uh felt more elevated than him he never uh he never acted like a star is what i'm trying to say um he was just he was just elvis and so that's the way we looked at him and, uh, you know, we were just family. I, and, you know, people wonder, well, why did he have so much family there? And the reason I, I truly believe is because we kept him grounded, you know, and uh, we helped. He knew that we loved him just for Elvis. You know, it wasn't the superstar. It wasn't Elvis Presley. He was just Elvis to us. And it's, it's really hard to get a lot of people to understand that dynamic, you know. As a matter of fact, I was uh, visiting with a German fan club just a couple of nights ago. And um, they said, well, when was the last time you actually saw Elvis before he passed away? And I said, oh, I don't know, a week, maybe two. And I said, you don't remember? And I said, uh, do you remember the last time you saw your favorite cousin? No. I said, see? You know, we had the same family dynamic as anybody else did. Just because he was famous, you know, that wasn't the way we looked at him. Yeah, I think, and I love that, um, Donna. And the first question, of course, comes into my mind that when, you know, he suggested Donnie to move in with him and your mom saying, thank you so much, love the idea, but no. <laughs> 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 and of course, my first question is, you know, I'm a mother, you're a mother. And yes. I wonder, I wonder what held her back at that point. Was it the fact that she wanted to keep her little girl or was there a little bit more to it? I think because my mother was, was a, such a wonderful and loving mother, you know, to let, let her 15 year old daughter, you know, move anywhere away from her, you know, for any length of, of time was just was just not something that she could possibly even, you know, conceive. And as a mother, I'm I feel the same way, you know. Um I remember when my 16 year old granddaughter, you know, I'd say, well, I, we've got to, I've got to run to the store. You know, she'd say, well, I'll be fine. I'll stay here. I said, well, I don't really want to leave you alone. You know, and she's me, me. <laughs> I'm 16. I can take care of myself, you know. <laughs> but not legally. That's the point. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I mean, it's just that that motherly protection. You know, Elvis understood that and he was fine with that. Uh, but he was thinking more about our grandmother, you know, and the fact that he traveled a lot. And so he wasn't home a lot of the time. So he wanted somebody there with her that, you know, would bring her joy and happiness. And so my mother understood that my dad understood, and I understood that as well and was excited about it. 
but you know, I, as a mother, I don't think I would have done it either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. I, you know, I totally get your mommy's reaction. Of course, on the other hand, you know, when when you hear about a story like this, you also think about other stars like Prince, for example. You know, and and it, and his empire also inviting uh, family members to live with him. And I think what you said yeah. before was so important that. He kind of gathered the gems in his life. He trusted. Yeah. And that was really the next of kin. And it went as yeah. far as going to invite the cousin to live with him because, again, that was perhaps something, as you were saying, that grounded him, that he could turn in, you know, could turn to without being seen as the star or the product, yeah. but rather yeah. as the person behind the product. Well, exactly. I remember Elvis walking into, uh, our grandmother's room. And I was, uh, as a matter of fact, I was in high school. I was 18 at the time. It was my senior year of high school. And uh, I was spending the night at Graceland because my parents said we're going out, they were going out of town. And so I spent, spent the night with grandmother, uh, my grandmother. <clears throat> and Elvis walked into the room, <clears throat> excuse me. And our grandmother had gone into the kitchen. So it was just me and Elvis in the bedroom. And he sat down in the floor in front of my chair and he was just talking to me. And he asked, he said, so uh, you're, you're graduating this year. What do you want to do with your life? You know, what, you know, what uh, career have you got in mind? You know, and who, who are you dating and things like that? It's just general conversation. And so I told him, you know, I said, well, I don't really know exactly what I want to do with my life yet. You know, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm dating, you know, but not, any one particular person and so forth. So uh, he said, you know, Donnie, I envy you. And I looked at him and I, I thought, you envy me, you know? And he said, yeah. And I said, why? And he said, because if you have a, a girl that comes up to you and she wants to be your friend, you know she's your friend because she likes you. And if a guy asks you out, you know, he asks you out because actually loves you and wants to go, wants to be around him, take you. He said, I don't have luxury. I never know for sure. It's me or if it's Elvis Presley that they're there for. And I found that so overwhelming, you know. And I mean, you know, you look at somebody's life like Elvis you know, being a superstar and, and iconic and having the talent and the looks and everything else that he had. And you think his life's got to be perfect. But it wasn't, you know, uh, because of everything that he had, because of everything he was, you know, he, he didn't always know when somebody wanted to be his friend or be a girlfriend if they loved him for himself or because of Elvis Presley. So I thought, you know, my mother always said that Elvis was a, a a bird in a gilded cage. And I never understood that remark until that night. And I realized, you know, it's, it is lonely at the top. It is lonely at the top. And, uh, you know, it's a very, very touching story. And there are so many thoughts that run through my head, Donna. Um, and the first is that he would disclose such an intimate thought and feeling and insecurity to a very young girl. I mean, young in the sense that, you know, today's 15 year olds are in many ways more clued up, in many ways not more clued up. But this is a deep insight into the anxiety of just really being seen as whatever he portrayed, which is fantastic talent, a fantastic product yeah. and something that really everybody mm -hmm. loved everybody loved but the person yes. behind nobody really knew and were they really interested that's the point and this is i think to say you see i'm it's so yes you know i envy you so much i'm so jealous because i i always have that insecurity why are you talking to me why are you close to me why do you you know why do you want to hang out with me is it me yeah and mm -hmm. uh this is very beautiful and um i think celebrities in general have that question mark and what what i want to ask you is when he disclosed this to you donna how did you how did you feel i mean also when you say yeah we were just a normal family but surely if i have a mega star you know at the end of the table <laughs> yeah. 
it happens to be my cousin. I'm like, not going like, oh, you, you, you know, and just be abusive because this is what you do with cousins and brothers at times, you know, just yeah. like, uh, that there is still this, but you are Elvis Presley, as you said, how can you say that? You know, how can you envy me? And I wonder, you know, mm-hmm. the kind of showers of emotions and questions that went through you in that moment. Well, I was I was really taken aback by it. You know, I thought, wow, you know, I I never looked at it like that, you know, uh, because, you know, because he did have family around and he knew we all loved him, you know, as just Elvis. But there were always a lot of other people around. You know, there there were the guys that that traveled with him, the Memphis Mafia, if you will, and so forth. And I knew he was very close to some of them. And I knew that they, you know, there most of them really loved him, you know, as a person. Um, and as a good friend, but, uh, you know, I just, I was really surprised by that, you know, and I thought it, it made me pause because I thought, you know, wow, you know, uh, that's gotta, that's hard. That's a dark that's place. really hard. That's a dark place. Yeah, it is a tough place. And I was only 18 and I thought, this is just, you know, I, I, I don't know where to go from this, you know, mm. uh, but then someone came in and, you know, er, er, other people started coming in because they knew he was in there. And it just kind of, the conversation just kind of took a different, different, you know, of course, and the chaos, thing. the, you know, the control, yeah. the uncontrolled chaos, came controlled in. chaos, came exactly, the control chaos. But you see, this, <laughs> this, this is what I love about this story is, of course, you know, the switch backwards and forwards. So you had him to yourself yeah. and he was all in that conversation. All of a sudden he opened the door and he opened the door of his deepest yeah. emotions fears anxieties maybe also pressures you know yeah. um and and looking at his um vita yes i do know the dates i do know what he did da, 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 da. but what i really tried to look at in my research into you and your family and i let me at this point also express my deepest console, uh, condolences because of lisa marie passing uh, Thank you. this year i, I am really quite quite uh, shocked because of it but we'll, we'll yeah. speak about oh, it a bit we later. all were yeah 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 i mean tremendous tremendous um is the you mentioned the people around him and so i did my my research more into the people rather than his vita because the vita is out there and anybody superficial is satisfied with that but i'm not yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. but i want to look at the, at the layers which you also in all the interviews that i saw with you you kind of always talked about in between the lines and not very often people actually docked on to that they they kept with the nice stories the fun stories you know the the, the mm-hmm. boats attached to the tractor in the snow and you know all these yeah. crazy crazy <laughs> stories fantastic yeah. But that yeah. was more, you know, what belonged to the crazy star, maybe having fun like a child because pressure mm-hmm. needs to be released. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the people in his life, which I think may also be a strong part to then how A, his life went and also ended. And the, the first thing, of course, one stumbles over is a couple of things. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I thought, OK, I look at the men in his life. They were all to me, and please correct me if I'm totally wrong, more toxic than conducive. And the important women in his life were more conducive rather than toxic. And I explain like my personal impression. The first two things I stumbled over, which I thought, wow, trauma big time, is him being born as a twin and having the lack of that twin. So uh, yeah. if, you, if, if you look at the dynamics of, you know, when, when twins are born uh, and one only survives, the surviving twin has a deep lack, which is very difficult to fill up, be it with whatever. And we'll talk about mm-hmm. that, that urge that seemed to have happened. Mm-hmm. And then the fact that his mommy, he dearly, dearly loved, died very early. So this, these are a couple of things. To what extent, knowing him so well and having lived with him and seeing these very deep, intimate conversations with you and maybe other people juxtaposed with the craziness at home and then juxtaposed with the craziness of the circus of uh, celebrity life, fame and fortune? Uh, you know, I think that... Uh... You know, he did have tragedy in his life, you know, losing his mother. She was everything to him. Uh, so that was a, a tremendous loss. 
And of course, like you said, and it's it's hard for anybody who is not a twin to realize that there's that connection and, you know, him having lost his twin and feeling that aloneness. And I think that that's probably the best way to, to describe it is you feel alone because you've lost a part of you. And um, growing up an only child and then, you know, just... Uh, you know, I just, I, I don't know. It's, it's it's hard to explain as far as uh, that loss. And Elvis was a person that was extremely um, passionate. Uh, he was extremely strong in his feelings. And when he loved you, he loved you all the way. There was no middle ground. There was no if. There was no and. There was no plus or neg- a negative. It was just he loved you with all of his heart. And uh, he was extremely loyal. And um, as I can attest to myself, because I'm basically the same way, I think all of the Presleys are, um, it's to our own detriment at times, <laughs> you know, because we, we will, you know, forgive and forgive and, and uh, hang on to people that we, we love when probably it would be let, better if we let them go. Mm. But, uh, you know, he felt that loss of his mother. And, uh, of course, I was only eight years old when she passed away. But I remember my mom telling me, you know, that it was it was so hard for him. And he told her, he said, Aunt Nash, I would gladly give up everything I own. And I would dig a ditch if that's what it took to have my mother back, you know. And he said, I never, ever want to go through that loss again. So I don't think that he felt in his heart and in his mind that he could take the loss of another really close loved one. You know, um, he and his dad were extremely close. Um, they, you know, they just fed off of each other, you know, and they gave to each other. And I mean, they would get in arguments and it's like, you know, all sons and fathers do. But, you know, they uh, they had this connection and this closeness. And then when he connected with someone else, whether it be as as a family member, you know, like he was extremely close to Billy Smith. Uh, they were together all the time. Uh, or if he, you know, a woman, you know, if he loved her, he he loved her, you know. Um, I won't say he was always faithful, you know, in that love, <laughs> but he always loved them. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was just, you know, you know, you know what I'm saying. Well, when I you're know the, exactly, and everybody when else. When you were the most, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, and I, you know, I was just, I was just with uh, Linda, you know, Linda Thompson, and uh, I love her dearly, and uh, we always believed that she was the great one of the great loves of Elvis's life, and uh, you know, she always said, you know, I, I, I never really never really blamed anybody for that. You know, she said he was Elvis Presley and uh, every woman, I mean, every man in the world wanted to be Elvis and every woman in the world wanted to be with him. And she said, when you, (laughs) when you've got that kind of love and that kind of adoration, can you imagine the pressure of that? And just knowing that you are your every thought, your every movement, your, anything that you did or said was, you know, a role model for somebody else. You know, millions of people all over the world. That's 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 a tremendous burden to be have that kind of love, you know. But then there and again, knowing that they're loved, was I was he loved? Did he did he know he was loved as Elvis or because he was Elvis Presley? Yes, you know. that is that is exactly that uh, that ambivalence, I think. And that is yeah. the truth of the matter, I think, of anybody that kind of made it. And and looking at his Vita, I felt that the reason why he's so strongly bonded with the pre Elvis Presley product, mm-hmm. family and friends was they knew him as the kid. They knew him as the poor child. They knew him as, you know, a child of parents that had a tough time. Uh, yeah. You know, they knew him before he was what he was to the globe. And I think this is what you find with many celebrities. And um, Donna just mentioned pressure. And you also mentioned, you know, one of his ex-partners and him being faithful or not. I think it is very, very difficult. And you see it with 
stars everywhere, be it even Boris Becker, okay? Mm-hmm. You know, you do have these groupies and it is yeah. like they throw themselves and I'm not accusing mm-hmm. anybody and it doesn't make adultery right or what have you. It's just, no. you know, I, yeah. I'm i married to a man that was a very big number in the corporate world. He held a speech. I was there watching it in the audience. And, you know, there's no comparison with a star like Elvis Presley. But after the speech, as he was going, walking off the stage, you had a good seven, eight, 12 women coming, playing very, you know, flirtatiously with the earring or in their cleavage, talking to him, asking, yeah. you know, important question. And yes. I think, of course, Dominic Strauss-Kahn. I mean, you've seen it over and over again, men, men being stumbled into and I think mm-hmm. one thing is love and the other is whatever happens on the side. And I think you have to include it. And and you're talking about um, his women. Let me, of course, talk about Priscilla Presley, because mm-hmm. she is the one that has not been that long with him. Right. Mm-hmm. But she is still standing. She is, of course, um, the the mother of um, Lisa Marie, grandmother to the three still um, living grandchildren. Mm-hmm. of Elvis Presley. Uh, I wonder, how did she come across to you? How did you perceive, because you were there, you heard your mom talking or your parents talking as well about that relationship, her being so young, the meeting in Germany, the hoo-ha coming or not coming to live and to yeah. marry and what have you. How did how did you perceive Priscilla then? And what do you make now as a, as a woman, married mother, you know, with your own story of, who she was and how stable she seems to have been all these decades, all these stories, never mind how, you know, what an abyss they were. What do you make of her? Um, Well, Priscilla and I, uh, she was, I think she's five years older than I am. And so when, you know, when I was staying at Graceland and she was there, we, we were friends, you know, we would go places together. We would do things together together. Uh, you know, and just we were just teenage girls. And I ran into her uh, about three years ago at uh, the guest house. And uh, it was during, uh, I think, Elvis's birthday week. And uh, I, so I went over and I, I was talking to her, you know, and it was like we were teenagers again, you know. And I remember the lady that was with me, she was saying it was it's so funny because she said, I see you two grown women, you know, and you're talking to each other like teenage girls again, you know? And uh, so I, I, it was kind of, it was kind of whimsical and, and funny, you know, in that way, um, you know, Priscilla was of course a mother to his only child, you know, and, and he loved her dearly for that. Um, do I think she was the great love of his life? In my opinion, no, I don't. Uh, but, you know, but they had a child together and, uh, you know, they were together for, you know, as far as not married that long, but together for, for a while. Um, and so she kind of grew up, you know, and uh, in in that time frame and, and in what was going on at that time. And, you know, having been dating the biggest star in the world, you know, that's that's a tough situation for anybody, let alone someone, you know, that's not really lived herself. You know, she's not gone out. She's not had relationships. Uh, she's not had a job. She's not, you know, she's not been molded into a, a grown up, you know. And so that kind of makes a difference there. Uh, I remember it was so funny. I've got to tell you this one quick story. It's so cute. Uh, we decided that we would go to each other's church. And at the time she was wrong. She was Catholic. So we went to Immaculate Conception here in memphis and um we had that service it was the first time i'd ever been in a catholic church ever and so we were you know just teenage girls and we were laughing and, and having a good time and we were enjoying the service and i remember walking in and i felt so stupid after she told me this but i said oh wow they got a footstool she said that's not a footstool it's a kneeling bench but i've never been in a catholic church before so anyway <laughs> so, so then we, we we would go to my church was was Assembly of God, which Elvis and I were both raised Assembly of God. So we went to my church and, you know, we're, we're clapping and singing and it's a totally different concept than the Catholic church. So we were sitting on the back row and uh, there were some teenage guys sitting just down from us in the same row. 
And they started sending notes. And one of them sent a note and said, hi, my name is whatever, said, um, I was wondering if you'd like to go to the movie with me. You know, he sent this to Priscilla. And she wrote back, well, I'm very flattered. Thank you. But I'm seeing someone. And so we laughed all the way home after church service. We could barely contain it during the service about, you know, if he only knew who she was seeing, you know. Uh, and so that was kind of a funny, you know, really funny tender story that we shared. And, and you know, like I said, we were friends when we were younger. Um, after she and Elvis divorced, uh, she wasn't around a whole lot. So I didn't see her, you know, and we just, you know, we've all we've both gone our separate ways and, and lived separate lives. And, uh, you know, so we don't really have a relationship of any sort whatsoever now. Mm -hmm. That's understandable. I mean, interesting, in one of the interviews that I read with her, she said, you know, I started becoming Priscilla only after my divorce, which is mm -hmm. quite interesting. And if you think about, you know, with 14, I mean, I didn't even think about dating when I was 14. <laughs> to be honest with you, I was, I don't know, still in the, in the <laughs> sandbox somewhere, you know. Right. <laughs> but anyway, just so to say, but I thought that was very strong for her to admit um, that, of course, she was, you know, once you start dating somebody uh, like Elvis Presley, mm -hmm. you are him full stop and you're always see is seen as a derivative if nothing else you know or something mm -hmm. that is next to the star and of course you're very important you have your role as long as you do have a role that's the point yeah. so and this is why i was thinking i was thinking of her somehow despite um then uh, having divorced him yes she was the mother to their only daughter but she then started really developing her own career and making it mm -hmm. to whatever extent it doesn't matter but if you think about it she's still standing she's out there she's had tremendous losses as well simply because mm -hmm. the entire you know presley family had losses she had her her lovers her 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 marriages as well but she's still out there and if i think also about how she helped to turn around the elvis presley the enterprise or made the Elvis Presley enterprise after you know Vernon died and all of a sudden you saw that Elvis Presley was almost bust and she then started turning around the entire the entire legacy of him and made it into the museum as far as I understand please correct me if if my research might have misled me uh, I thought that was astute so there she was a 14 year old girl getting married having no identity until she actually was off of that, but somehow mm -hmm. been elevated at least into the limelight, but she made something out of that platform, mm -hmm. but not only just for me, myself and I, but also then for the legacy of, you know, the, the most wonderful star we're just talking about. So I mm -hmm. thought that was, and I think that she, she was certainly a, a big um, element, it seems, in the love that you were talking about earlier that he could express. Now let's, let's move on to, to, um, Lisa Marie a little bit because uh you know the, the again the love the devotion the togetherness at, as maybe not not as partners but as parents between Priscilla and Elvis was admirable especially for those times you know? right exactly absolutely they so, both you know both put aside whatever feelings they had toward each other or or, or not and uh and made you know a parents to Lisa Marie and they both loved and adored her, and, and she did, you know, them as well. And, you know, we were all so shocked. And unfortunately, I, you know, I didn't spend a whole lot of time with, with Lisa uh, when she was younger, you know, then I, I spent time with her. But as she grew older, you know, she was living in California. I was living here. You know, it's just one of those things you just don't see each other. Uh, and to be quite honest, I think that that's a lot of to her detriment because I think that having grown up uh, with, the same type of, of uh, knowledge and the same type of upbringing that Elvis had, it would have made her more well-rounded and more grounded, you know, and, and knowing, you know, growing up with family uh, that, well, the same people that raised Elvis, the same people that raised me, you know, having that, that uh, good, wholesome Southern background and, you know, uh, about, faith in God and, and family values and, and so forth. And I, I think that would have helped her tremendously. I really do. And made her feel more uh, a part of things. Um, so in that much, I really hate that. And and uh, and I feel the same way for Riley and Harper and Finley. I think if they, they could get to know Elvis's immediate family, 
you know, those of us that are left. I think it would uh, not only be beneficial, you know, uh, to to us to get to know them, but also to them to be around the kind of people and and the same kind of uh, knowledge and, and upbringing that Elvis had. Yeah. So I think that would really help them a whole lot because yeah. they're living, you know, you live in California, uh, you're in that uh, entertainment, you know, and, and there's a lot of plastic in that, in there, you know, and a lot of people that are just simply just there for whatever, you know, there's no, there's no warmth, there's no growth, there's no feeling, uh, there's no substance to a lot of people, you know in that industry and living in California. And so I, I think that would help them all greatly. And and I'm sorry that I missed that opportunity with Lisa Marie. I really am. And when she died, uh, oh, wow, what a loss. Um, even though I didn't wasn't close to her any longer, it, it was such a tremendous loss because it, it's like a, a string that's pulled, you know, it not only uh, not only her death, but it brings back every death in my family, you know, there's Elvis's death and Uncle Vernon's and grandma's and my mom's and my dad's and the aunts and uncles, you know, every family member, when, when one, another dies, it brings all that back. So you have all those tremendous loss feelings, you know, so it, it was, it was very difficult. It, it really was, it was very painful. The point you were just making about her and also Riley being in California, being in the mill of the entertainment, which grinds mm-hmm. you and most of the time grinds mm-hmm. you either because it's opportunistic or it grinds you down and then you're a victim of it. Do yeah. you, when, when, when you say, you know, I felt a tremendous loss, is there also a lot of regrets that, you know, people in the family would have had also the opportunity to just pull her out and fill her with the values, which I hear Mm -hmm. in between the lines you're pointing out that, you know, where you come from, there are strong values, there's strong Mm -hmm. faith, there's strong, there's strength in the closeness of your DNA, Mm -hmm. which might get lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, I, 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 I do regret you know that that I didn't try to uh, to get a hold of her and get close to her and you know just just talk to her and be with her you know just like I would say my own grandchild or my aunt granddaughter or my sons or you know because we are an extremely close family we always have been uh, the the Presleys have a very strong love and loyalty not only to each other but to people that we take into our lives you know and as I said. Not only, you know, as as did Elvis, to our own detriment at, at times, uh, but still, you know, that's that's who we are, and that's how we live our lives. So I do regret not reaching out to her, and it's it's been on my mind, you know, uh, really to possibly try to reach out to Riley, you know, and say, you know, just just would love to get to know you, just you know, because and maybe maybe because she, you know, she's Elvis's grandchild, but. You know, all she knows is, is, you know, what her her mother's told her, you know, and, and unfortunately, Lisa was nine when Elvis died, you know. So for yeah. somebody who grew up with him, yeah. you know, who spent time with him, who uh, spent time with our grandmother and his father and, you know, other members of the family, I would love to just tell her about them, you know, yeah. let her get to know them through me, you know. Yeah, and I wonder to what extent... Uh, she actually has the same feeling and the same thought, but something holding both of the sides back. Because if I was, you know, the grandchild, despite she has a fantastic career, she really took Oh, it yes, she does. She's so talented. She's a beautiful, super- talented woman. Exactly. Beautiful, talented. And she just took uh, even a step further, you know, what her mother did. Um, so yes. and maybe the third generation, even better. So, so there's a lot going for her. And I'm sure, you know, if I was in that position, I would go and huddle up to you and say, tell me about my granddad. Tell me about my granddad. Why am I so talented? Yeah. So it's kind of almost, yeah. you know, <laughs> kind of like, what is it in me? You see, you saw in him and, you yeah. know, tell me. Yeah. And it's, I, I think this is so interesting if you do your self, um, you know, analysis and you go into your mm-hmm. own 
even into your own dark places and say, oh my God, maybe my grandpa had it or even my mom had it. And you actually look into that a little bit deeper. And I wonder whether you both are at the brim of reaching out or whether there is now also her being the, the only heir, I think, having it taken over from Priscilla now for, for, mm -hmm. for, for, uh, of Elvis Presley's enterprise, mm -hmm. which is of, of mm -hmm. quite a value, whether she now feels anybody approaching me now, they're just after the estate. You know, there's always this... Yeah money crap it, in between yeah right? and there's that you know there's that situation and, and i would never want her or our or harper family to, to think that that would have anything to do with it because it wouldn't but you know there and again you you you've got that i mean it's there so you have they have to wonder well, why are you approaching me i would have I, you know i would feel the same way probably but uh you know it's it's just one of those things and and i i'll just pray about it and and if god's meant for us to get together then it'll happen so it will it, it, it will happen it, it will happen yeah i think because yeah. you know money you lose you can make but people they happen and you can't remake them i mean i think that's is, right exactly opportunity. yes and when they're gone they're gone and and they're they, gone exactly and you know i i think we regret what we don't do more than what we do so uh you know and and i learned that firsthand you know with elvis because uh I saw him in concert many times all over the country, but I I never went to Vegas. I always wanted to, but I always thought, oh, I'll ask him next time. You know, I'll say something because I knew all I had to do was say, oh, so I'd like to see you in Vegas. And I'd been there, but I just I just didn't do it. We never asked him for anything ever. So, you know, I just thought, well, you know, I'll mention it next time I see him or something. And I, I didn't. And then I ran out of next times. And so now. As, and that was probably the first domino, you know, to where I am now, hmm. because I think, you know, if I had said this, if I had done this, you know, things could have been, you know, totally different or, you know, or either something more could have been, you know, I, I could have gotten even closer or whatever, you know, but I didn't. So now I try to live my life boldly. I try to... Um, push past push past the fears and just go out and do it because i don't want to regret in my, when i'm to the point where i can't go or can't do i don't want to sit there and regret that i didn't do it yeah okay. and so that's one thing i always try to tell people you know elvis told me the same night that he that i was talking to you about he he told me he said you know when he asked me what i wanted to do with my life and i said i really don't know yet and he said well just remember this, Donnie, you can do anything you want to do. You can be anything you want to do, want to, if you'll remember these four things. Always have faith in God. Always have faith in yourself. Be willing to work for what you want. And never let anyone tell you that you cannot accomplish your dreams because I'm living proof that you can. So anytime I go on stage and I talk to people, I tell them, you're never too old to accomplish your dreams. Always work toward that. Don't give up. Live boldly because you're going to regret more what you don't do than what you do. So that's just, that's the way I've chosen to live my life now, you know. Yeah. And uh, I, I think it, it's it's helpful to people. Totally, totally, because it goes so beyond. And despite us talking about an episode from a big star, it is applicable just to the human being and that we all are, whatever the position, whatever the intelligent education, uh, fame or what have you. And what really touched me there um, was that you never went to see him. And of course, uh, that would have been also my next, uh, next um, point I wanted to talk to you about is his relationship uh, to the colonel, you know, to the colonel Tom Parker, who made him, yeah. but who also, in my eyes, really de degraded him and, you know, made him to what he was in the gilded cage and then the victim mm -hmm. of the situation. And mm -hmm. when I hear, and please, again, if I'm if I'm too forward, too bold, uh, That's all right. I'm, I'm totally wrong. But I feel you saying, you know, that was oh, that was the first thing I learned from Elvis. I should have gone. Um, it was the first domino to fall. Of course, my thinking is yes, because at the end of the day, that was really the beginning of the end, I think, of 
him, not only his career, but him as a persona, a, a human body, a human mind, and just this wonderful person we've been just talking about. I wonder, you said he had the family to keep him grounded. Looking back in all honesty, do you think that the family could have really done any different, any more, any whatever the any may be to stop the trajectory which was slowly creeping in with the weight, with the pressure you mentioned earlier on, with his mood shifters, with having only trust in the colonel and Dr. Nick as the two seemingly pivots that he was that he was kind of like focusing on and perhaps not even letting anybody else getting any closer. Well, uh, honestly, you know, I know my mom talked to him, you know, uh, and they were close uh, because she was nine years old when Elvis was born and she lived next door to him. So they played together. They grew up together, you know, and so they were they remained close. Um, and she talked to him. But, you know, Elvis was uh, a very strong willed human being, had to be to be able to accomplish what he what he did. But at the same time, he could be manipulated by the wrong people. And like the colonel, uh, I only met the colonel twice, uh, but I found him to be extremely boisterous, uh, very cold and kind of commanding kind of person and uh, very demanding. And manipulative so uh, you know i think there and again that was that uh, what i was telling you a while ago about loyalty to a fault even though it's to your own detriment and elvis felt that loyalty they shook hands they didn't have a contract they shook hands you know and when elvis gave his word he kept it and that's something that you know, uh, I learned at my grandmother's knee. My mom learned. Elvis learned. We all learned it from the same people, you know. When you give your word, it's your bond. So you keep it. And so I, I think that although at the end of his life, I do truly, truly believe he was ready to step away from the colonel and away from a lot of the negative influences in his life. I truly believe that. But unfortunately, he died before he was able to uh to access that. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Colonel was very manipulative and I think he had this hold, you know, and, you know, it, Elvis wanted to tour Europe so badly. And the Colonel always worked it out where he had to be in the States. You know, he had some big thing going up here so he couldn't go to Europe. And that's why, that's one of the reasons that I absolutely love to work in Europe. Uh, I spend most of my time working there. And um, it's because, to me, I'm able to fulfill a dream that Elvis never had. He, he always had that dream, but was never able to accomplish it. And so when I go there, I always try to remember, and these are things that I pray for. God, help me represent you, represent my family and myself to the very best of my ability. And if I can go there and stand on stage and I can sing or I can talk to people and I can touch their hearts and bring, you know, Elvis's bloodline, his DNA, but also some of Elvis to that stage with me. Then I'm standing in his stead and I'm accomplishing something and finishing something that he wanted to, that he started. And, and so that's, that's what I try to do. Yeah, and I'm so sure he knows. I mean, I don't know how you believe, uh, you know, what you believe. Um, yeah. I, I do think he's that. died, but but I I think he's very close to you right now, and um and you know you've also been married to a, a big music name yourself, and uh, you talked about the pressure before, and uh, it is a tough business, and I wonder you know this loyalty to your own detriment. I love this. I see this in other people. Um, and uh, whilst it is good, I, I you know I I try to empathize with Elvis. There you are. You're a kid. You're extremely poor you do have a talent you are different i mean you are white yet singing black you are yeah. white yet moving black i mean you're the elvis the yeah. pelvis you're shaking up everything in the music industry and all of a sudden you know our you know rock and roll pop culture is born thanks to him yeah. then this guy comes along right and he promises you xyz and hey you don't have anything to lose 
and things mm-hmm. become true. And, you know, when you grow up in lack, if you grow up in poverty, if you grow up with a mother that mourns one of his, her children, maybe tries to cope with a certain, you know, use of substances, which is not easy mm-hmm. on the family either. Right. Then you have somebody that unplugs you, makes the financial, the products, the, you know, the material things and dreams reality. Oh, my God. And you can pass this on. This is why I think he was so, so attached to the money, but at the same time detached from his wealth and giving Mm -hmm. it away because he just, you know, catalyzed something. And the opportunity of that something Mm -hmm. was the colonel. All right. And that I think that that happiness to realize his dreams as a, you know, Mm -hmm. as a singer, as a talent, but also financially for him and his family that he was loyal to. That, that that act and that person because of that, whatever then, you know, the personal motivations were with uh, Colin Parker's, I think he was a gambler, uh, mm-hmm. hence the deal in, in, in Las Vegas and whatever. And he just used him as a golden goose until. Yes. Yeah, e- exactly. So, you know, and, you know, I, uh, I hate that, that, that it happened, you know, because I think that, um, yeah, I mean, you know, we often let other people in our lives, uh, they do things that end up costing us and hurting us, you know, and it's not that we were a part of that, but it, we, I guess, allowed it to happen in, in some instances. So, uh, you know, it's it's very difficult to, to try to live your life and, and to be um, the person. I Well, let me explain it this way. I think that there was always a fight in Elvis in, internally in that he always struggled because he wanted to be one person but felt like he had to be another. Okay. And mm. I, I, I think, you know, that that's... Uh, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons that gospel music was so important to him. It soothed his soul because he grew up in church, you know, And he had that strong faith in God and he read the Bible every day. And, you know, he knew that, uh, uh, that, that life. And, you know, he knew that he was blessed by God. He was an ordinary man. He was just an ordinary man, but he was blessed by God to do extraordinary things and to touch people all over the world. And the way that he touched them was in the fact that it wasn't just his music. He was the greatest entertainer that ever walked on a stage. But he was also one of the dearest and greatest and finest men that ever walked on the stage of life. And he he let people see his vulnerabilities. He let people see that he uh, he cared about them. And money meant nothing to Elvis except what he could do for other people. That That's the whole that, thing right there. Yeah, this is what, is he, what he could do for us. Yeah. And, you know, he's he touched people's hearts. And when you touch a person in their heart, then you step that person holds you there and they raise their children and their grandchildren with that same value and that same uh, wholeheartedness and love that, that they have for you. And so that's why 46 years after Elvis's death, he's still as big, if not bigger than he's ever been in his, in, in his entire life. And it's not going to end anytime soon because I met, like I told you, I was meeting with the German fan club at a restaurant in Memphis. And there were some girls, and they were probably 12, 15, something along those lines, who come running over and were just absolutely in tears because they found out that a member of Elvis's family was there, and they wanted to meet me. And, and when I walked over to them and I hugged them, they just were like shaking and just crying, you know. And I thought, wow, here he is. I mean, they didn't breathe the same air that Elvis, you know, breathed. And here they are, so young, and yet they're huge fans of Elvis's. And I, I, I thought, wow, what a, what a legacy, you know, and that he's still touching lives. And there's people in this world that are chosen, I do believe that, to do great and mighty wonderful things. Uh, I think Princess Diana was one, and Elvis was another. And, you know, they are loved and they will always be loved, even though they've been gone for many years now. 
Yeah. So. And uh, I think it's so true what you're saying. And interesting, you know, my, my daughter is 18. And when I said I was going to speak to you, she was exactly like, oh, my God, starstruck as I am. <laughs> um, and, and I love it. And she said, oh, Elvis Presley. She says, my favorite song is In the Ghetto. Mm -hmm. yeah. And which I thought was like, whoa. <laughs> this is this is a heavy song, and it's 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 one that I loved as well as a child. It didn't yes, yes, yes. Her. It struck me that she would pick that song and that she would know, you know. And and uh, it is so so true. And something also you just said, um, Donna, is vulnerability. And uh, you know, I wonder because when I looked also at uh, you know the press after he started um, in Las Vegas, he started having weight problems. As you mm -hmm. were saying, he is a star. He's an ego. He was loved because he was beautiful, charming. He was, I mean, we wanted him all, you know, yeah. this is yeah. for sure. <laughs> and still today, whatever age he would be right now, I think he would be as handsome and sexy and attractive. Yes. All the rest of yeah. it, I'm quite sure. But, um, you know, the mockery started. That that must have been hard, I think, where where he, you know, he had the pressure to perform. He had a, a hundreds of shows. He had this year contract. Uh, I don't need to name numbers because everybody can research it. But I'm just thinking, you know, where does this lead you if you see that you're, I don't want to say you become demode because he didn't go out of fashion, but he, he got out of what people saw in him and he knew it. Hence also, mm -hmm. I wonder how painful it was for you also, even though you didn't didn't go and see him, to see, you know, whatever his body reflected was going on inside as well. And whether this was already a bit of a telltale story of what was to come. And then when, you know, Dr. Nick, uh, Nicol N George N Nicopoulos, I think his name was, yeah, Dr. Nick mm -hmm. was also questioned about, everything that um, Elvis had in his blood um, that was discovered in his um, autopsy, it was prescription drugs, it was uh, barbiturates, it was amphetamines, it was opiates, everything, you know, appetites, um, hampers or whatever you call them, suppressants. Mm -hmm. And then the heart condition, of course, which might also be a bit of a family story. I wonder to what extent that was just like a self- um, like a, a prosecutorial movement, self-fulfilling prophecy, feeding into one of the lines I read when he said, well, I expect to die young because in my 40s, maybe because my mom did. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm packing a lot of thoughts and I'm sorry to maybe... No, it's okay. ...overwhelming because I see him as somebody that by himself, his own pressure or wish... wish sorry. Yeah, sure. Wish to be perfect, perform all the time on one hand, but cannot do it all the time unless he's got little helpers. How did you see that? Well, well you know, uh, my mom and I talked about this and uh, she, she truly feels that as far as the uh, prescription drugs came into to play was actually when he was in service because he had lived his life entirely as, you know, well, I say as a vampire, but and when I say that, I mean, you know, at night. He was up all night and slept during the daytime. And so then all of a sudden he's thrust into this enormous, you know, thing that he's got to do. And he could, and let me say this, he could have done it with on the USO and just performing and taking care of the, you know, entertaining troops, but he didn't want to do that. He said, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it as a soldier. And he earned the respect of, of everyone who was around him. Um, but here he had to pull KP duty. He had to do, you know, he had to stand on the wall, you know, as, as we say, and, and, you know, protect and, and so forth. So he had to do everything that everybody else did. But, you know, then your, your whole life is, is turned upside down. It's completely different. And I think that, you know, my mother felt like that it was probably started there because he would take something so he could stay awake you know, when he needed to be, and you take something to go to sleep when he needed to go to sleep. And it becomes a vicious cycle. You know, you start out with control, but then in the end, it controls you. <clears throat> and it's not something I think that anybody sets out to do. It's just what happens. And then, of course, you know, he had a lot of infirmities in his body, you know, and he was, he had to perform sometimes three times a day. You know, that's, 
That's a treasure. That's a lot of work. It's unbelievable. That's a lot of work. And, you know, just to do one show a day is tremendous. I mean, most people, you know, stars that are doing shows like that and, and doing them the way Elvis did them, you know, 150% all the way, it was like, you know, they would lose, you know, he would lose weight, you know, during the show. And, and you know, you're exhausted. And then to have to turn around and do that two more times, uh, it, it becomes, you know, just you feel like a trained monkey. And I think that's how Elvis began to feel was like, you know, just wind me up, put me out there, you know, that kind of thing. And I think that that's probably something that maybe in his own mind, and this is just my opinion that, you know, maybe in, in doing that, it was like, um, he kind of gave up, you know, and it just, he just kind of accepted it and just went with it until his body was just to the point it just gave out. And every member, every member of the Presley family has died with congestive heart failure. My mom did, Uncle Vernon did, my Aunt Delta, everybody did. And so it's that's something that's, you know, genetic in our family. Uh, and, you know, there's just so much that the heart can take before it before destroys it itself. Yeah, before it breaks. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I think just to... to make it a broader conversation here, Donna, and you are so much in the, uh, you know, celebrity industry, also through your own marriage, is, you know, mental health, celebrities and mental health, depression, uh, anxiety, anxiety attacks, um, even suicide. I mean, I did my research here and there are so many like Lady Gaga, Ben Affleck taking antidepressants, being prescribed by the doctor. And even when they say, I would like mm -hmm. to stop, the doctor says, no, you can't. You have to take them. Otherwise, you know, you're going to break. Right. Jim Carrey saying he was in depression. And he actually said, depressed means your body needs deep rest. Which I thought was kind of like, you know, on the yeah. American come. You know, and this is something I think is very important. And I wonder what what Elvis would do now, also with the pressure of social media, uh, banging mm -hmm. down on these stars. And nowadays, it's less and less a taboo that you are not dehumanized by the persona you represent. You're an idol, yes, mm -hmm. but you're a person, you're vulnerable, you have feelings, you have desires, you have, I feel ugly mm -hmm. today. I mean, I was, you know, for 13 years uh, hold, you know, hosting a show, a live show on CNBC. You had to be perfect all the time. I didn't take drugs. I just went to sleep at four o'clock in the afternoon because I did the breakfast show the next day, you know, but yes. I know the pressure in my own little world and experience me to be there, switched on, talk sense, look beautiful, be charming, have the energy over and be over. perfect, be perfect. So mental health, tell me a little bit about where you see where we are and what society is actually doing to celebrities as well in terms of causing even this anxiety or, you know, wh where does it start? What is the chicken? What is the egg? Is there, is there a kind of a vision you have? Uh, I mean, well, well, look at it, you know, like you said, with social media, you know, I mean, it was hard for Elvis back then and we didn't have that. Can you imagine what it's like for celebrities and, and, you know, children of celebrities today? And I take Lisa Marie, for example, you know, uh, everybody expected her. She's Elvis Presley's daughter. So she's got to be perfect. She's got to be beautiful. She's got to have this great body. She's got, you know, because, you know, look what he looked like. And, uh, you know, she if she gained weight, then she was too fat. If she lost weight, she was too skinny. She must be taking something. She must be on some kind of drug. She must be doing something. And it's a, it's a vicious cycle. And there's always opinions. And with computers today and with social media, there's all these people that have nothing else to do but try to destroy somebody else. So they sit behind their little computers at their little desk and they type away about, oh, well, this, or, or she's looking terrible and she's gained weight and she's fat and she's being a disgrace to her daddy and this, and, you know, or she's anorexic. So she's, you know, she must be taking drugs or whatever. And it's got, I mean, imagine what that's like, uh, being bullied every single day. And we have children in schools today that are being bullied who, commit suicide because they're being bullied. And our societies are doing nothing about it. They're accepting it. They're thinking it's okay to be bullied. Well, I, you know, it's free speech. I can say what I want. Not if it's hurting somebody else. You know, 
I agree. If you got your thoughts, keep it to yourself. If you don't like her, don't go to her side. I mean, this is the way I feel. If you don't like me, okay, uh, there's nothing I can do about that. Don't come to my side. Don't have anything. If I come on television or come on the radio or if I, you know, at, at a place, just don't go. Problem solved. You know? <laughs> you know, why try to destroy somebody's life because of your own insecurities, because of what you think or what you feel? Perhaps you don't know the whole story. It's just a misconception of something that you've heard, something that you've read that be, could be completely erroneous, but that's what you've decided you're going to believe in. And I, I think it's, uh, in some ways, social media is great. I mean, it gets people out there that wouldn't normally be able to. You can connect with family members that you wouldn't be able to connect with. But there's, you know, the devil's in the details. And so you can all, also destroy people's lives by the very thing that that was supposed to be created for good you know so uh, you know it's it's hard and i think it's it's uh i think we need to look at ourselves uh everything's become so politically correct to get along with everybody that there's nothing there's no direct stance and if you don't stand for something you'll fall for anything as the song used to say you know and uh i so i you know that's just that's my opinion that's the way i feel and that's the way i live my life i i love that if you don't stand for anything you fall for everything that mm -hmm. is such a strong sentence you see and that is i think what a lot of these celebrities start to miss as you were saying right at the beginning mm -hmm. of our conversation, Donna, it's very lonely at the top. And one of mm -hmm. the celebrities I, I listened to who was uh, talking about his mental problems because of his stardom, he said, you know, I don't have a mom, so I cannot turn to anybody and talk. I just cannot talk because whatever I say will be misinterpreted on purpose because it makes a good story and it backfires or it hurts me. Yep. And another, yeah, and another celebrity, I think it was um, Billie Eilish, she said, you know, uh, if you feel homesick despite being home, something is wrong. Yeah, this yeah. is true. Yeah, exactly. And, is, and we all sometimes feel, you know, being alone is one thing. Being lonely is what I feel when I feel lonely is I'm with a bunch of people and I feel isolated. You know? Yeah. Because uh, when you're in that situation, like like Elvis and like Lisa, and uh, you know, and, and even in my own instance, for you know, to a certain extent, you don't know who you can trust. You know, you can't go to somebody and pour out your feelings because you don't know what. Well, you know, if somebody gives them ten thousand dollars to say what you said, whether it was correct or not. You know, take it out of context, then that's that's done. So you, it's it's very difficult, and so it is. It can be very lonely. Um, you know, and I, I try to keep my, my circle small, but there and again, you know, uh, you believe in somebody that's not worthy of, of, of your, you know, love and, and your faithfulness and your loyalty. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it happens to all of us. You, it just happens, you know, yeah. not everybody is, is the way that they should be. No, absolutely. And, you know, it makes me think Donna of Riley right now. And all the wisdom you speak and, you know, the deep conversation we are having here. Um, to what extent do you think she is actually in danger or do you think she has the right, I want to say, trust, entourage, um, human support? She needs to continue her fantastic career, you know, and staying straight despite the loss of her mommy, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think she has that um, or do you what would you say to her right now as um, as a line of support if you had the chance? Oh, that's a good question. Um, to me, I don't know her personally, uh, but from watching her, from seeing her, uh, she's immensely talented, of course. Uh, she, she's beautiful, but I, she seems to be very, very well grounded. Uh, I think that Lisa was a wonderful mother. I think she gave them love and support and uh, as much of uh, that grounding as she could possibly could without knowing all of it herself. Um, so I think that that's, that helped her. Uh, but I think she's very strong. I think she's uh, she seems to be very wise and very grounded. Uh, so for that, I'm extremely grateful for and, and thrilled for her. Um, but I, I think what I would say, 
is what my grandmother would say, my mother, what Elvis would say, is always have prayer in your life. Always turn to God. Because if you do that and you let him guide you, you'll never go in the wrong direction. And even if you falter and you do, he'll bring you through it. So that would be my advice to her. And also that to uh, people that she knows that she can trust, keep your keep your inner circle small with people you know you can trust and uh, rely on those people and uh, trust in yourself as well. And, uh, you know, don't let other people persuade you one way or the other. Trust your gut because, you know, you can hear a lot of things and you're, and, you know, I, I'm one of these people, I get in my head a lot, you know, I'm thinking, well, this and well, that, you know, uh, and, and I also lead with my heart a lot too. And a dear friend of mine told me, he said, hey, this is what he said, trust your gut. It will never leave you, never go steer you wrong. Trust your gut because you can't always trust your head. You can't always trust your heart, but you can always trust your gut because right. that's the, that's what that God gives you that center so that you know. And I, that's what I would say to her. And if she ever wants to reach out to uh, people and, you know, not just me, but other family members, you know, Billy and, and, and Patsy and, and any other family members that she wants, we're always here if she needs us. Oh, I love this. Oh, this is this is a wonderful, wonderful message. I hope she will watch our conversation. Um, <laughs> I hope really, really, because maybe there is a connection coming. And I'd, be, I'd be so, so happy about that. And I wonder, you know, um, as we're saying, she's strong. She lost a brother due to suicide, yeah. which was uh, mm -hmm. another tragedy in the family. Yeah. And, um, I, and I wondered, looking into her own persona, whether that actually really made her even more determined. Because, you know, these kind of incidences, they can make and they can break you. True. That's true. Because you will either go one way or you'll go the other. And I think that in in losing Benjamin in such a tragic way, uh, you know, probably has strengthened her and given her determination to be a stronger person. And to, uh, I don't know if she has any of the depression or anything. I have no way of knowing that. But if she does, you know, uh, go to somebody that, you know, you that, that can help you if you need that help, if you need medication or, or whatever, you know, don't be afraid to to seek that out, you know. Uh, but there's one thing I wanted to ask you because you keep mentioning it and I'm not sure that I understand. You said something about uh, me being married to somebody in the entertainment. I'm not. Okay. I've okay. never been I've never been married to anybody in the entertainment industry. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then let's let's clarify that because okay. there is a buddy early, and sometimes yeah, but he's exactly. And I think sometimes it's like buddy early uh, Holly and buddy Holly early. I mean, it was, I was really quite confused. I should have asked you rather than no, no, no. That's okay. But no, he was never in the entertainment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. No, thank but, you very much for for clarifying. Um, yeah. Uh, I th I think what what um. You know, we, we're coming to, to the end of our conversations. I could really, really, it's so amazing um, information. And, and I think really we took a quite a deep dive in, you know, the family dynamics and all the emotions mm -hmm. you, you portrayed them. I, I, I felt what you're feeling and also with the, you know, with the good advice and with the, with the faith. Um, what do you think Elvis would tell his 16-year-old self looking back, you know, right now? If he had the chance with with, uh, you know, all the experiences you had with him, all the all the trajectory of then his career and also his passing as as a grown woman. What do you think he would make of that um, and give an advice to his 16 year old self, his teenage self? Wow, that's a good question. Um, he would probably say those very same words he said to me. You know, and saying, you know, you can do and be whatever you want to be. As I think he would probably tell him, always have your faith in God. Have faith in yourself. And be willing to work for what you want. And don't let anybody else tell you what you can and cannot accomplish. But also, I think he would he would say, you know, keep your, keep your circle small. Trust your gut. Don't let loyalty or whatever is in your head or in your in your heart 
lead you to a path that you know is not the right path. And, uh, you know, it's happened with me. Uh, you know, I've made, you know, I, I've been involved with the wrong people. Uh, it, just as you were talking about the, the man that I was married to, it was definitely the wrong person. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it led me to, um, it caused me a lot of pain, a lot of suffering and, uh, a lot of uh, detriment to my own well-being and, and because I did uh, stay with him and, uh, you know, and made him a part of my circle. And so, you know, that way, I, I think uh, and Elvis also uh, had a hard time in, in his love life, you know, uh, because he didn't always know, you know, if, if a person was there because he was Elvis or because he was Elvis Presley. And, you know, he had that fight in him is in, in, in who he wanted to be and who he thought he had to be to maintain who, you know, Elvis Presley. But uh, I, I think that's that's the things that he would say to him, you know, is just trust your gut. And, uh, you know, those people who loved you before you became Elvis Presley. Stick with those. Go to them for your advice. Don't seek the advice of others that you don't know what they what their agenda is, but stick with those that you know loved you before you became who you were meant to be. Mm. And that's what I think. And but you just said the man, he had to be in the man he wanted to be. In your eyes, what do you think, what sort of man did he want to be? I think he wanted to be a man who uh, stood for something, you know, uh stood for for his faith in god and i you know i've seen him i've been to many concerts and i've seen him stop them you know when people would hand him a crown and call him you know elvis the king and i've seen him stop the concert and say there's only one king and that's the lord jesus christ i'm just a man i'm just an entertainer you know uh and i i think he probably would have he loved what he did Don't get me wrong. He loved it. He loved being an entertainer. He loved that connection and that energy he shared with the, you know, with the public and, and with his fans. Um, I, I think he was let down a lot in the fact he always wanted to become a serious actor. And there again, was not able to go into that because, you know, he was a box office draw and everything he was doing was you know, selling millions of tickets. And so, you know, that's, they wanted to keep him in that genre. But uh, I, I think that, uh, who he wanted to be was to be stand up and be strong and say, okay, now I want to do this music. Uh, I want to do this, this movie. I don't want to do the, you know, boy gets girl, boy loses girl, boy sings to girl, boy gets girl back. You know, those kind of things, you know. Um, <laughs> although I have to say, you can take your whole family to one of his movies and you don't have to be embarrassed. <laughs> But yeah, I, I think that he would have wanted to be a stronger person than what he was in his own in his own self and what he felt that was right for him and not listening to what, you know, he felt like he had to be to maintain the lifestyle and the uh, iconic person that he was. So that's that's what I think it is. You know, he meant in saying, you know, you know what I, I say that about, you know, wanting to, who he wanted to be and who he felt it had to be. Because he had all these, you know, especially back then, you know, they, he didn't, they, you know, stars didn't have control like they do now. So, you know, he had to go with what the, you know, the Paramount or whoever else, you know, was working with, you know, that what they said. Uh, you know, the colonel was the manager and, you know, I know what's best for you and, and so forth. So, you know, I think he would have wanted to be stronger in, within his own self and within his, his own thoughts and who he thought he should be. And I think that's that's probably probably what he would say to yeah. his 16 year olds. Yeah, that, that that's in incredible. And looking at all the songs, Donna, which song do you feel most touched by when you when you listen to his songs, which is the one? Oh, you wow. I feel I feel closest to him when I listen to this. Oh wow, that's 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 hard to say. Uh, I mean, you know, if if you go with gospel songs, I, I would have to say how great they are. Uh, but also, uh, I walk those golden stairs. I love that song, and it it, it says so much, you know. And uh, you know, gospel was his all time favorite. 
But as far as a secular song, um, I like if I can dream because it really makes a statement. That, that's that's a beautiful song, you know. And he sang it with such passion. Uh, American Trilogy was another one he sang with such passion. You know, I mean, you could, I mean, I can hear that song now, and in uh, and I cry, American Trilogy, because I could see him standing on that stage and feeling so proud to be, you know. A, a part of the United States, you know, and standing up for his government and 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 for God and and for uh, love of family and and country. Now, I, I can see him doing that, and it touches my heart. And that's probably another one. Uh, but I also like the less known, the more obscure song, like "Just Ask Me" or uh, "Never Ending." Um, so young and beautiful, you know, things like that. I mean, they really speak to you. And when Elvis was singing to you, I don't care if there was a million people in the room. You thought he was singing just to you, but he also had that uncanny ability that when he was talking to you, there was nobody else in the room. You knew he was talking to you, and that's all he had his focus on at the time. So he made you feel important. He wasn't looking behind you to see who else he needed to talk to or who might be more important. He was talking to you, and you knew that. That's authentic. So. That's authentic. Yeah. That is, I think, yeah. in all of, you know, what you were saying, the stories uh, and also, you know, the curtains you just opened also into his soul and in his persona. And he was authentic and he was perverted or oh, in a perverted yeah. system. Uh, you called it manipulated. And uh, deep down, I think what you were saying, perhaps his biggest regret was he he would say, listen to your gut, maybe because he just couldn't due to his loyalty. Uh, you know, right. the gut, as you were saying, he wanted to get out of it, but then the body did not allow him. And you also mentioned, Donna, uh, pride, being pride. I mean, I uh, being, being proud. I think what you are doing and the enthusiasm, the life you give his legacy and going around, especially here in Europe, being, uh, you know, his attaché, his candle and, and keeping mm. him alive uh, is so fundamental, so important because he truly is not an icon. He truly shaped what we have in music culture in the 21st yes. century and it will last mm. beyond. So yeah. um, wonderful. Chapeau, as they well, say. thank you so much. I, I strive, I strive to do that. I do. I try to do that very well. So, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. As I said at the beginning of our conversation, I'm starstruck already. Can't wait. Oh no, no, no! <laughs> That's to have you funny. over in Europe, or I'm coming down to you. Uh, you know, uh, well, if you're, you're ever over here, let you call me. Okay, <laughs> I, I will. So, thank you so much. Please keep it going. And okay. uh, yeah, and if there's any chance um, that that Riley will reach out to you or you get that nudge and you just say, hey, you know, yeah. who cares about everything? But, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm truly happy and proud of you as a yeah. you know, grandchild uh, of my cousin. I just wanted to let you know. Yeah. And that's always maybe a nice hook to, to pick up. Yeah, that, I mean, that would be nice. It would be lovely. So hopefully that will happen someday. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wish you all the best. And also, thank you, my dear community, for having joined us uh, here together with Donna Presley, the first cousin of Elvis Presley. He didn't like to be called the king of rock and roll, but there you go. He was definitely more than a legend. See you soon and stay curious. Together, we go out there. Together, we begin to share.